Welcome to How to Buy Online Safely. I'm Preston Snyder. And I'm Adam Jones. And we are excited to talk today. Our heart for today is that we love the internet. We buy online regularly. We've been scammed before because life happens. Uh, and we do recognize there's a dichotomy of purchasing from one-off vendors versus let's buy everything from Amazon or eBay. Uh, and kind of becoming homogenized as a retail economy. So we kind of want to take the opportunity to explore holistically what buying online can look like in many forms and how to be safe and smart about it. Yeah, and even even if you haven't purchased online, there is still a risk that your personally identifiable information is out there in some form. Um, and so this is really just, you know, where where are safe places to go and purchase? How do we evaluate? How do we keep ourselves safe? But then also, how do we create systems for us to make sure that we are being careful at every step of the way? So uh, what we're going to cover today is we're going to start with personal safety and a grab bag of here marketplaces and just some general tips for best practices and things to look out for and talking a bit about use of credit cards and other proxies and payment. We're going to talk about places to shop online, kind of a tiered safety list, how to determine if something is legit, and explaining different functions for different types of websites. And then also looking at, there's a lot of buy now, pay later. There's review sites with fake reviews, but then are they real reviews? We're not sure. Um, and then when you're purchasing online, there's a lot of opportunities for warranties, insurance, etc. And how do we identify or choose what is going to be the right path for what you're trying to get at. But then also, at the end of the day, how do we know that it's real? We want to share three easy steps about it, and then a few anecdotes of how these things can be pretty um, conniving and malicious in nature. So we want to walk through those in general. So first things first, here's a few tips and a few thoughts on personal safety and some on credit cards. So first thing for safety, above all, do not get rerouted, which what that means is that if you enter a website, make sure that you are still on that website, that you don't get taken somewhere else. Uh, looking, asking, and evaluating, will a button or link take you off site? Something to know is that if you hover generally over a link or a button, usually in the very bottom left corner, you will be able to see what the link is. So if it's you are on supposedly Amazon and it takes you to I love scams getting scam.com, let's not click that button lest we run into something like this. Maybe we've seen before where flashing lights, you have won, you are the 10 hundred thousand visitors, you've won a new phone, click here to confirm now, you are the winner, biggest winner. Do it now, and if you do get rerouted, odds are that you have either, one, been taken to a lookalike site where scammers are deliberately trying to steal your information, or two, you've gone to a site in potentially infected with malware or other malicious software that's attempting to harm your device. If you do wind up somewhere else, it's best to just close your browser, depending on what you've seen, maybe run an antivirus scan, and then simply start over. Uh, checking to make sure, okay, is this actually Amazon? One of the best practices, we've talked about this before for scammers, is that on download pages, running ads that are just download buttons that make it look like if you're going to download something, you're accidentally hitting the wrong button, going somewhere else and being taken off course instead of getting what you're looking for. So it's always good to kind of be cautious and look through. So first things first. Next, we're going to talk about a market that is, we've heard about, generally safe and is like an entry level to getting started with uh, internet interaction. It's Craigslist. Craigslist is an online community board where you're able to post community activities, jobs, and goods and services. It's really focused on setting up local in-person communication and transactions. So oh, we're setting an event here. I'm going to post about it. Here's how you RSVP. Hey, I have a job. I need somebody to do this for a week. Uh, contact me to let me know and we'll get started at X location. Hey, I have a car that I need to, uh, that I'm trying to sell. Come take a look at it. Uh, I'll give you a walkthrough at X location. While the website itself is online, it is probably the least 
online of the marketplaces with the understanding that if you engage in it, odds are that it's going to be an in-person activity at some point. And that being said, with them, there's going to be a lot of, um, there are some scammers in that area, and those are going to be mostly related to ACH payments or wire transfers, and they're not going for that in-person workplace environment. So then if you're there to buy, sell, trade, and they're wanting to do everything remote, that's going to be one of your first clues that this this isn't quite quite right. And of course, with any other in-person interaction, be smart, use common sense. Uh, especially if you're meeting with a stranger, just be careful. Otherwise, it does have a pretty decent reputation, and it's I've used it. I've known people who use it, and it, otherwise a fun, good experience of let's meet people, let's start something out, let's do a trade. The next kind of tier of service we see is membership perks. There are a lot of websites and organizations that will have associated perks for joining their membership programs. Some of these are free incentive programs such as Safeway, where, okay, you are now entitled to specific pricing on products because you are a Safeway member. Uh, We'll see things like a lot of coffee shops, restaurants will have a punch card system or something of the like of the more you spend, buy 10 things, you'll get a free sandwich or a free drink or whatever it is. Starbucks is a reward program incentivizing you use the mobile app and we will give you more rewards, more free drinks. McDonald's, similarly, a lot of these, hey, do the things, sign up for the program, be a member, and we will give you access to different things. Some are paid memberships, like our great gold standard of Costco, where You have to pay for a membership to even get in the door, but in doing so, you get access to a lot of really good items and a lot of really good deals. There are other things such as Canva, where you do get a free access to the program and can do things, but if you actually want the high quality things that they're producing and a lot of the templates you see as standards, you are going to pay into their pro membership. Now, the other thing to notice is that you do run into things like multi-level or network marketing scams where you are now being roped into pay us for this thing that you're not going to use over and over. And by the way, it's really hard for you to get out of this and you've essentially become trapped in a subscription type service. So understand what you're buying into before you pay. Uh, It's always good to kind of understand your terms and conditions and that what you're trying to buy, is it what you're trying to buy into or is it something else? And of course, you are always free to do a level of research to make sure you are getting what you're paying for. On that, shipping is a very interesting thing. There are some offers, some dubious or otherwise, that will guarantee you a product if you agree to only pay the shipping. Sometimes when you do this, you will end up with a steeply discounted product that you only paid shipping for. Sometimes you will have just lost money. So it's very important to read the terms carefully, look up the offer to see if it's a scam or not, or what people have said. Uh, So we have had hit or miss on some of these where uh, we have gotten the thing that we have asked for after a while, uh, and it's just taken a while because in paying the shipping, the caveat probably was that the shipping is maybe not the greatest and it takes longer uh, and it's trying to move inventory. Some of it is just, congratulations, you get nothing. Surprise. So just being careful about, mm, is it too good to be true? Vet, see, take care. It Generally for these offers, it's always a risk. How much of a risk? Uh, wait and see. Another thing that is just interesting worth talking about is transaction fees. Depending on the market or payment processor, you may see a variable range of transaction fees on various websites. Usually this comes down to whether the vendor's chosen payment processor includes card transaction fees into their price or not. So generally, if you're going to do your Amazon, your Walmart, uh, even like if you're buying gas or things, uh, the transaction fee for using a card is usually built into the price. So you're not going to get an additional transaction fee for electronic payment. Uh, It's just assumed that Amazon is choosing to take that cost. Walmart's choosing to take that cost, whoever it is. There are other organizations, uh, typically with higher priced items. Sometimes this is renters, lease landlord associations. Sometimes it's childcare or things where it's like single bulk cost where you'll see, uh, hey, in doing this, if you're going to do a card or electronic payment, 
you are entitled to like a 3.5% uh, card transaction fee. So at that point, that organization is choosing to, uh, okay, here's our at cost, and then that cost is on to you instead of just generally raising their prices. So a few people play it a few different ways, and it's just good to know that that cost is always there. It's just where they're deciding to put it, either into the price or just to show it to you. However, it's good to go over your line items anyway before you complete a purchase because sometimes transaction fee or whatever is can just be, congratulations, you gave them $10 extra for nothing. Or is it a tip? Uh, is it a tip that you didn't actually authorize and now it's on your payment? So just when you're buying something and you see that confirmation of, all right, here's your thing before you submit your card information, make sure that you paid for what you said you were paying for and you understand everything that is on your receipts. So there's a lot of checking and double checking in these processes, but it, it's just good to, just in case that doesn't seem right, a few of those can add up quickly. The next uh, genre of marketplace we're going to talk to is drop shipping. And this is when somebody buys a product directly from a supplier, wholesale uh, pricing, then resells it at retail pricing for a profit. Profit. The supplier then ships the product directly to the customer without the vendor having to hold inventory. So there's a lot of Shopify websites that will do this and a bunch of other independent vendors that's like, I have one product and we're moving inventory like this. We're going to get it to you faster than another marketplace because we're not going through a middleman or a medium. It's just A to B, you're going to get it. Uh, and while there's been uh, a way people have been able to run and manage business, and legitimately so, uh, there have been drawbacks both on the vendor side and the customer side. And they fall generally into these categories is that quality of the products. From a vendor side, you are you never see the inventory. So you don't actually really know unless you have it ordered to yourself, whether it's generally a good product or not, and you have no access to true quality control. Uh, on the customer side, you may be you may have paid thirty dollars for something they got for a dollar fifty. It happens. So, it's, did you just buy a low quality thing with good marketing? Be careful. Consult your reviews. Dependency on the supplier. Uh, if they run out, or there's a shortage, or something happens, uh, you have no control. And customer service lives and dies on the supplier at that point. So a lot of this tends to be, you will buy something way low price from an international vendor. If you're getting that sent to domestic United States address, you run into this potential wall of, oh, uh, there was something that happened or, oh, United States is not currently taking shipments from China or something's locked up in a port. And what was supposed to be a week faster than your consumer is now, you're probably not gonna see this for three months. Good luck. Uh, nobody has control over that. so. Uh oh, and then of course scams. And like anything else, there's scams in this market where it's like, okay, you can get this thing right now for seven dollars, and it's going to be shipped to you, and you paid seven dollars, and you're probably not going to see anything, and maybe your information has not been compromised. Be careful, be cautious. This is an up and coming where drop shipping platforms have pivoted into, oh, this is a way to run a scam. So be careful because it also undermines people who are actually doing a good job. So identify and be careful with your marketplaces. Uh, one of the big ones too, a marketing practice that we'll see on sites like these is, do not believe the hype because time is not running out. Over the top, bold flashing lights with things like this is your last chance, out of stock forever after this moment. Clever marketing, but it's rarely actually the case. And that being said, there are some legitimate sales that do occur. Um, if you're a little bit older, you might re remember the Bon Marche one day sales. Amazon has Amazon Prime Day or Prime Days, depending um, where they do steeply discounted items, but typically in those scenarios, you can find those items on clearance at later dates or sometimes even at steeper discounts later in the season if you're just watching. Now, granted, it, the, for Amazon Prime, yeah, in the moment, that's actually probably a good deal, a good sale if you're in the market. But then when you have uh, groups like, this is from tmoo.com, uh, they've been really running a ton of advertising 
Um, they're trying to compete with a lot of other vendors. They are a uh, Chinese vendor that's trying to sell in America. They're going to say, hey, free shipping on all orders uh, up in the top. You have nine hours left to meet that deadline, which in certain cases has been true. If you really want it by Christmas, Thanksgiving, or other times, we need this order in by X date. But they run that free shipping on all orders every day. So the time isn't ever running out. They say they have lightning deals that end in also nine hours. Okay, well, what's the difference? Are you going to do lightning deals every day? Well, maybe. But then in the bottom left corner, oh my, bonus coupons, one hour left. And these all have counters to try and show like, oh yeah, time's running out, time's running out, time's running out. And they are trying to build a little bit of anxiety into the user to help you make that purchase. And, and I say help you make that purchase. I, I'm not going to use the word manipulate because we're, we're still volitional and choosing, but it is going to raise our anxiety a little bit to move forward in that element. So do your research on a product to see if you're actually getting a deal or if you are the target market for a hype campaign. Similar to that, things like events, ticket sales is another one where, oh, first 100 gets $50 off ticket. That is probably absolutely accurate because they want to sell out that first line of tickets. Uh, there are some time sensitive things. Other things though, Black Friday is kind of an infamous uh, infamous case study of you have gotten great deals that are in this price for the past few months and your November, December, this is on a steep discount to be the price that it was back last July. So yeah. again, if there is an item you're excited for and it goes on sale, watch it, watch it for a period of time and see if that price manipulates. And it's very possible you will run into a great deal. And in that case, absolutely jump on it, but just be careful and watch your markets. One of the other items that we want to bring up is using something like PayPal as an intermediary. Um, and it brings in this idea of multiple layers of protection in your buying. And I'm going to use the example of eBay. Uh, eBay is where you're able to buy and sell from other people. eBay facilitates the transaction. And eBay, in a lot of times, will do a buyer protection saying, if this is not right, we will refund you the money. If you were going to buy a car part or a new iPad and they sent you the wrong item, we're going to make sure at the end of the day that you are taken care of. But that can sometimes take a while. But that is your first layer of protection. The marketplace vendor is saying, I will take care of you. Then if you use PayPal, PayPal says, I will take care of you as the person who is taking care of the transaction and facilitating this. If there's anything that goes wrong, I'm going to take care of the seller and the buyer. I want to hear both sides of the story. I'm going to be the judge and see if really you were scammed or maybe you're trying to scam the other person and they're going to try and do that layer. The last layer is your credit card so that, hey, if eBay doesn't help you, if PayPal doesn't help you, then the credit card company, I can go to them and say, you know, this the item came back, I went to eBay, I went to PayPal, no one's hearing my case, this is not an iPad, I really would like an iPad. And then their, their credit card company is able to say, great, you were scammed, we are going to stop the payment and refund you your money back to your credit card. And so then you're creating these multiple layers of protection by using these different tools. Now, I will also state that we do recommend using a credit card for online purchases versus a debit card. And I, I'm a Dave Ramsey guy. I love most of his material. I firmly, firmly believe in using a credit card instead of a debit card, because if you do get scammed, your cash is going to get tied up. Meaning if your debit card is compromised, you no longer have access to the cash that may have been siphoned out of the account. Whereas if it was pulled from a credit card, eh, that's just fake money. That's money that you're borrowing against. And ultimately, it's the credit card company that wants to make sure that they get their money back. So the credit card company is actually incentivized to stop that payment and work through any of the other issues. So when you go from that approach, even if there is an issue that occurs, it, it might take a month or so to work out the fine print and the details. 
but you're not compromising uh, your personal assets in any way. So that being said, how do we evaluate where do we shop and how do we do it safely? How do I mitigate this risk of being scammed or having my information compromised? Um, and part of that is looking at the people that you do trust. Purchasing from Walmart, purchasing from Costco, eBay does a really pretty good job. Of course, everybody likes to shop at Amazon. Those are really good, safe places to purchase online. There's also the manufacturers. You know, if you're not sure that these Nike shoes are real or, yeah, I really need the Timberland Pro brand, not just normal Timberlands, I can go to Nike or Timberland and purchase the high quality item that I'm desiring. And you can know that you're trusting and building this trust relationship with the manufacturer. You know that's coming direct from them. Now, that being said, you may pay a little bit more, but how much is that trust worth? right? And that's what we have to decide when we're trying to mitigate this risk. The, the hard part when we look at this is that, and this is the disclaimer at the bottom, there are these marketplace integrations that are occurring where Amazon, Newegg, Walmart, etc., are allowing a lot of these third-party vendors to come in. And that's why you might say uh, or see 20 or 30 different types of water bottles that all the pictures look the same, all the descriptions are the same, there's varying levels of reviews um, and there's varying levels of price, but they'll all say that they take two to three weeks to ship to you. Um, and that's where they're having local e-commerce, brick and mortar groups, having access to sell on Amazon or eBay, Walmart. But then it's been opened up to a lot of these third party uh, Chinese vendors who are going to flood their drop shipped items. So it, it becomes a little bit difficult to be excited to purchase from local vendors who are really not local or stimulating those local economies. And then we begin to only purchase from Amazon fulfilled or Walmart shipped and fulfilled. And ultimately, once again, we're kind of homogenizing this e-commerce activity. So there's a dichotomy here. There is a overarching issue. And so once again, we want to mitigate that risk, but then also get the right items. So we have to think through that. There are other marketplaces similar to eBay. You have Etsy where you can buy and sell craft goods. Um, I've actually purchased quite a few handcraft gifts from local people at different states or even within my local community through Etsy. But then you have groups like Reverb or Swappa where it is similar to eBay where you can do some bids or buy it now, but they're only specifically for one category of products. And the reason they do this is because they're actually typically charging a lower transaction fee. When you sell on eBay, if you're just kind of on the lowest tier, it actually costs you anywhere from 10 to 15% of your sales transaction to sell on eBay. So if you sold an item for $100, they're going to charge you $15 for selling it on eBay. Whereas with Reverb, it's going to be anywhere from 2 to 8%. So you're able to save quite a bit of money as you're working through that. Now, you also will have groups like KEH.com, which they sell camera lenses and camera equipment. And they're more of a reseller where you sell to that group and then they sell it to your general consumer. Once again, they're able to sell it at a lower price and a lower discount, but it's still a high quality item. You'll also have vendors like inkforless.com. They, they've actually been around for a really long time where they just really believe in ink cartridges not costing an arm and a leg. Now, some printer manufacturers have gotten a little bit finicky on this where they try to say, oh, only use the OEM ink cartridge. It happens, but they're trying to provide a alternative, right? They're trying to provide a good alternative to other items and they make it themselves and they sell it themselves. You have PC liquidations, Dell refurbished, uh, Dell Refurbish is where you can buy refurbished or scratch and dent items from Dell.com themselves. They just don't sell those items through Dell.com. Monoprice.com is another kind of group where they do um, kind of like generic sized products, but it's, sometimes it's nice to get a generic product that's just good at a little bit of a steeper discount. 
Um, you also have iFixit kits, uh, kits, they do uh, glasses as well. There's all kinds of these really niche, really specific items of, we want to make a good product. We are doing the manufacturing, supplying, and distribution. Uh, Deep Brand is another one where you can get skins for your electronics. I mean, I do want to show a few examples of those, um, like for inkjets. Um, once again, they have generics and they also have OEM. They want to provide the best quality products to you so that you're able to save that money instead of going to a big box retailer and spending extra money on that retail. They want to send it direct to you at a discount. And they're actually a pretty good company. And once again, they've been along, around for a long time. Uh, Monoprice, um, they have cables. They also have TV mounts. They have all kinds of stuff. Uh, most of the desks in our office are standing desks that raise and lower where we've been able to purchase good quality generic desks. Um, and it's been a wonderful experience. The uh, other group that I wanted to show was dbrand, um, where they do kind of skins and wraps to help protect your electronics. If you want to put something on your laptop, they have things that custom fit the laptop and look pretty cool on top. So they can do switches, cell phones, etc. They manufacture it, they supply it, they do a good job. And so these aren't products that we're gonna find routinely or regularly on Amazon or on eBay or other places, but they're still trying to provide a good product and service. So we have to be aware that they do exist out there, that not everything is just Amazon Walmart. That being said, we then begin looking at these individual company websites from overseas vendors. Uh, like I said before, Timu has been advertising really, really pretty heavily. Uh, Wish.com is, I would say infamous for their quality of their products. AliExpress, Alibaba is where you can get quite a bit of wholesale items. Uh, Xi'an is really focused a little bit more on the fashion side of items, um, but they tend to be fast fashion items that are gonna wear out fairly quickly in general. Now, are these groups legitimate? For the most part, yes. They're gonna buy and sell items at a discount, but uh, sometimes they're gonna ask you to buy 20 of an item to make the shipping worthwhile. Well, there's going to be severe drawbacks in the quality of the items you're getting. And once again, these groups are also selling within Amazon and Walmart already. So if there is an item that you're like, oh, I'm not sure, you can actually grab the name of the item from Walmart, pop it into Xi'an or Timu, and see if they're selling it directly there. And typically from Timu or others, it will be at a lower price point. So then do we really need to purchase it from Walmart? Hit or miss. There, there's once again risk involved and there's gonna be a bit of buyer beware for the quality of the items. But if you're okay with that quality or if it's an item that, you know, qual it's, it is what it is, you might be able to get away with some good items at a lower price point in a fairly safe way. But once again, I would say use PayPal use that layered intermediary strategy to shield and protect yourself in case the products did not come as expected. Another strategy that has popped up recently is the idea of buy now, pay later. And we're also going to talk about evaluating reviews and some insurance thoughts. Uh, so if you're going through maybe every now and then uh, walmart.com, you've gone and you've seen this little guy at the bottom of your thing. Uh, sometimes it's for things that are more expensive. In this case, oh, look, a queen mattress. Uh, that's $1,400. Uh, or I could be paying $72 a month with a firm. Uh, what is that? So a firm is a buy now, pay later app and service that allows you unqualified purchases to be able to turn a larger expense into a set of smaller payments over a time, very similar to a loan. There are a few of these companies. There's Firm, Klarna, Afterpay, uh, and a few others that take various forms. That's just, okay, we're going to do a big down payment and then we're gonna set things up over time for you to pay out the rest. It's important to note that even though it is a service that is offered on these big brands, Amazon, Target, Walmart, et cetera, the service isn't actually offered through them. It is offered through a firm as a third-party lender. 
Uh, unlike a traditional lender, a firm gives you more options on how you want to make a down payment and to choose the duration over which you want to make the payments depending on the merchant. So instead of, all right, here's a deal, you're going to have a 0% down payment, but it's got to be over the course of 12 months. It's a, well, can you do it in three? Okay, let's do it this way. Are you going to need it to be closer to 18? Okay, we'll guide through. And they're really a bit more willing to work with you on determining how to set up a payment schedule. Uh, a firm does take factors into account, such as your credit score, in determining the types of loans available to you. So it's important to keep that in mind that there are a lot of things of, in a way, it does kind of similar uh, factor to paying with a credit card. Uh, and it's also important to remember, above all that, a firm is still a lender. And if you are making payments over a long period of time, you have to make all of those payments on time every time. So the inherent risk is you can make this thing way more affordable, but you need to make sure, are you going to be able to make those payments over the course of a year or the next four to six months? It does function similar to your credit card. So a lot of the risks and drawbacks do end up being the same uh, with less opportunities actually to help it build your credit. So for example, if you do get a 0% interest deal or you do something over the course of three month payment periods, uh, typically those aren't reported to credit companies. So it's a great, you've got a great deal, no harm, no foul, everything's paid off, but it's not going to boost your credit. So then that's a, well, then would it have been better to do this on a credit card at a similar deal and then boost your credit? So there, there's a lot of questions to ask, but they are very functional and they are rather accessible. And that being said, PayPal does have its own buy now, pay later system. However, they operate a little bit more like layaway, though you still get the item. Um, and they, I would say they're in some ways more flexible in setting that payment structure. Um, they really prefer to set you into payments of four. If you can make the first payment today, let's do three more payments. Or, you know, throw you monthly. Um, at 12 months, 16 months, 18 months, etc. But they really do try to hit this pay in four installments just so that there's a little bit more timeliness to it. And it kind of forces the buyer to say, okay, I do have the money to do this and subsequently following. Um, they do provide you a bit more purchase protection because PayPal is still going to provide that, once again, that intermediary. They're going to guarantee that, oh man, if that item comes back, as incorrect, well, we don't, we don't want our money tied up with it. We don't want this loan money to be on a scam or inaccurate item because the value of the item is not the same. They're going to help you with that because they want their money back. Whereas a firm is just going to say, hey, here, here's your money. Whether the item was good or bad, I don't know. I don't care. You have a loan. PayPal is a little bit more invested in that transaction. Once again, as the facilitator of the transaction, they want to be a part of that. And PayPal, like the others, are going to still hit that credit score. It's probably not going to boost your credit score. And if you already have a PayPal account, well, it's only a couple clicks away. Meaning you don't have to go through a third party like a firm to set up a whole new account. So it there are different programs out there. There are different systems. Um, evaluate what, what works best for you in these in these modes and models. Let's see. It's not scrolling. Yeah. What to do with reviews? Reviews are an interesting thing because we've seen what we call the Amazon effect come through where a lot of people no longer trust a one-star review or a five-star review because five-star reviews can be bought. Um, especially with these drop shippers, a lot of them will pay for five-star reviews. Um, there's whole Facebook groups about of, hey, we're going to send you the product or we want you to buy the product. We're going to reimburse you after your review comes through. So in a way, a lot of people have stopped believing a pure five-star review. On the flip side, there's a lot of people that are no longer trusting the one-star review. Because if you actually read the one-star review, it's either not the right product, or you did the product wrong, or literally you just didn't put it together correctly. Um, and I've, I've actually seen quite a bit of these where, oh my goodness, people are ranting about an item that it didn't come with the right parts or the right thing. 
And then you have people responding to the review saying, actually, you were supposed to insert this item over here. You're supposed to do this. Oh, it attaches this way. Trying to help the one-star review actually use the product that they purchased and wrote a poor review for. So then it becomes this idea of we can trust a four. A very well-written four-star review is more gold than a true five-star review. Similarly, a two or a three-star review of, oh, okay, uh, it probably wasn't you having a bad day. It looks like you legitimately came to a bad conclusion or very much it's middle of the road, but if this is what you're looking for, it'll probably like it. This wasn't, eh, uh, becomes more trustworthy. Yeah. And, and that's where we do highly encourage you to read all of the reviews. Now, granted, if there's thousands of reviews, don't read all thousands of them, but do, do spot check it. Check the fives, check the fours, check the ones, and get, get an understanding of how people are evaluating these items. And we would encourage you, please write reviews so that other people kind of know what to do and how to look and evaluate the same product. Because if it is really a bad product, tell us about it. Tell us why it was bad. Tell us how it did not fit or meet your needs so that you can prevent other people from having the same poor purchasing experience. And it's not also not to say that you should deliberately not leave one or five star reviews depending on your experience. If you had a quality five out of five stars, great. Uh, we allow that to be reflected in the content of the review itself and just the content becomes more important at that point. As you go through, especially Amazon, Walmart or others, you are going to see a lot of, hey, do insurance or pay a buyer protection or warranties or this or that. We want to take the time to walk through that a little bit together because Amazon especially has been very interesting with the way that they position refurbished slash renewed slash refreshed items, which I don't know why you would call an item renewed versus refurbished. Aside from renewed doesn't sound like it was broken, right? A refurbished item sounds like it was broken. You went there, you fixed it. Now you're trying to sell it again. Okay, well, I mean, was it a quality repair? I don't know. Where a renewed item means, oh, it was probably working fine and it just needed some cleaning. And now I'm going to sell it with a one year or three month warranty to make sure that people feel comfortable. Uh, refresh is the same thing. At the end of the day, whether a product has been refurbished, renewed or refreshed, it all means the same thing. It means that there was something wrong with the item and it was returned. And now we are going to try and sell it. And that's okay. I, I've, I personally have had a really good experience purchasing refurbished, renewed items. But we want to make sure that you are aware that you are purchasing a refurbished item and to be aware that this item may not be new. And that's probably why you're getting it at a steeper discount. Because that's the other kind of marketing trick that they'll do is they'll list the, especially for a flagship cell phone, uh, they do this a lot where they'll list, hey, this is an $800 cell phone, but we're only going to sell it for $250. It's like, wow, that's a, that's a crazy discount. That's more than 50% off. I need to buy that. And in small print off to the side, they'll say renewed. I, I'm not a, a big fan of that practice. And so I... It bears taking the time to go through it. The other clue that you may be purchasing a refurbished or renewed item is a very big push for the insurance plan. Now, they you will have a manufacturer warranty. Um, Dell will typically do a 90-day warranty. Sometimes they'll do a one-year warranty on the refurbished stuff. And that is with the manufacturer saying, if it breaks within a year's time, I will still fix it. Whereas insurance says, hey, if the manufacturer's warranty is out of date and you bought a two-year uh, insurance plan with us, if it broke, we will fix it. Uh, given that you didn't break it yourself, like it was just normal, normal wear and tear um, versus the return policy, right? In the return policy, you can return the item to Dell or to wherever you purchase it from but sometimes they are going to say, hey, you know, we would love for you to just send this back to the manufacturer or send it back to this other group. Or 
you know, you had 15 days to evaluate the item. You now need to go do the warranty or you need to go use the insurance. Um, so please read the fine print. Uh, these three items are not the same. And even within insurance, there are typically two versions. There will be a standard plan and an accident plan. The standard plan is, hey, my uh, wireless earbuds that I purchased, they broke after two months. I paid $3 for an insurance plan. I was like, sure, why not? They were refurbished. Usually $50 headphones, I got them for 20, it was cool. Yeah, and they legitimately broke. They just would not sync, they would not charge. Filed the insurance claim, they had me mail them to make sure that I wasn't lying about it. And that's fine. And then they sent me $17 so I could go buy a new set. And and it worked out well. Now, it wasn't seamless. It took two to four weeks to kind of walk through the rigmarole, but I was able to get my insurance claim and work through it. Versus an accident plan. A lot of people will purchase this and a lot of cell phone carriers will offer this in the stores where, man, if you did drop your phone into the toilet or into a body of water, we are going to give you a new cell phone with caveats, usually. Um, Even though they're promising you that full return of a cracked screen or a new phone, I've actually yet to successfully get a accident insurance plan to work. Um, now, other people may have had different experiences. Typically, my phones, uh, I only had one time where I've needed to file an insurance claim for it. it. They've been finicky. They've been pretty finicky. So then we have to ask the question of, is it worth it? I'd say sometimes. I'd say sometimes. Um, once again, we need to look at how are we going to mitigate this risk? You know, if it is a $200, $500, $1,000 item, you know, is it worth the $50? And I would say it is worth it if you're going to be good about the paperwork. Uh, Walmart is actually pretty good with their buyer protection plan because they have it set up where if you scan the uh, receipt with your app, you can go and do that insurance claim, that buyer protection claim really pretty quickly without having to make sure that you keep all your receipts in order because I promise you that that Walmart receipt, that does wear off. Uh, The moment you stick it in your wallet, man, that is just rubbed away um, and you're unable to scan it. So we do recommend after you've made that Walmart purchase, scan it with the app to make sure that that receipt is logged to your account so that you can go in and make that insurance claim. And there are groups that will do it. They're uh, all state protection plans, Azure, uh, Azuron, Azurion. They, they do provide them um, and they work, ish. I, I can't say whether one is better than the other, but they're both running it. Um, once again, it's only as good as your paperwork to go and do the claim. And now our final section. How do you know if it's real? First off is the, what we call an SSL certificate. Now I I will have to demo this one because this is kind of a finicky item. Every website, um, if we look in the top left corner, you'll see a little padlock up here, right next to the URL or the address bar where we type in, hey, we wanna go to this website, there is a padlock. If we go ahead and click on the padlock, the web browser will tell us whether or not this connection is secure. Now, what that means is it's saying that if I type in my email address to sign up for an email newsletter, or if I type in my credit card, my connection to the website is secure. There's no third parties listening in on that connection. Now, granted, if it's a scam website, you're sending your information directly to the scam website, but generally, if it's a good website, a reputable website or a third-party independent vendor who, you know, they have a brick and mortar, they're trying to sell some e-commerce, you are directly sending that information in a secure manner, knowing that that little lockbox is there. Now, if you see that that lockbox isn't there, or sometimes it'll have like a big red mark with a slash through it, I'd recommend hitting that back button. Um, That means that the website is insecure and whatever information you type into it is not going to be transmitted securely. Even if it is a uh, brick and mortar mom pop shop, that connection is not secure and you are running the risk of having your information stolen at that point. 
Now, it doesn't mean that that institution is necessarily out to get you, but it does mean that web maintenance needs to be done. There's a vulnerability and we best not risk it or come back later. Yeah. The other item is there are third-party verification sites like Trustpilot. They'll go through and have reviews about other websites as kind of a third-party review. So when we go and check out keh.com, maybe we do want to buy some camera lenses. Hey, this website has a 4.6. People have had good experiences. There are some people who have had bad experiences. I'm going to check and see. Hey, I asked you to change the address. Uh, and can even cancel the order by phone. They didn't. That's a bummer experience. That happened, oh, just a few days ago. Wow. That's a bummer, right? You called, customer service didn't fulfill it. But does that mean that the website was good or bad? Well, they were able to make a purchase and their information wasn't stolen. They just had a bummer customer service experience. Whereas if we look at some four stars, hey, I did get the wrong item, but it was fast shipping. Hey, another great order from start to finish. Great order start to finish, but <laughs> it wasn't worth the five star for whatever reason. KEH, you're great. Please stop using FedEx. Cool. Right? This is a place for them to provide legitimate reviews and legitimate feedback to try and figure out, is this a safe place to buy? Is Am I being scammed? No, I just don't like FedEx apparently for this person. And that makes sense. Trustpilot and other third-party vendors are a great way to see if this is a legitimate site. The other thing you can do is you can always go and search, is this domain a scam? And we do recommend typing in, is blank a scam? scam. Um, because there are gonna be people who are going to have complaints. And you're gonna see pretty quickly if there are complaints or scams or other issues that pop up, those will almost always hit the top of the chart. In this uh, example, KEH, Trustpilot came up first and foremost to say, yes, this is a legitimate place. Um, another third-party vendor has 70,000 reviews. If you're running a scam, you're probably not going to get 70,000 reviews. Or even in that case, if you were to buy that, that's pretty expensive. Most scammers don't want to invest that type of money to make a scam work because it's honestly not, not worth it. And so then you're able to kind of get a sense of, is this real? Is this fake? Just right off the bat, uh, right off the bat, doing a quick search. Now, the bonus is, of course, if it's too good to be true, odds are it is. And there are going to be a lot of places that do try to sell low quality items or fake items. Me and my dad, we, uh, we do a lot of woodworking projects. And we did find a website that looked, and I will say looked really, really legit. And it was Dewalt Tools at 80 to 90% because it said, hey, these are refurbished. These have been remanufactured. You know, shipping is going to be a little bit high because these are heavy items, but, or this is our warehouse. We're trying to sell everything. We did do the K, uh, the, the trust pilot, it was a newer site. They didn't have information. We did try to say, hey, is this a scam? There wasn't any data. So I was like, okay, so it's a newer site. Do we take the risk? And so we went ahead, we made a purchase. We used PayPal with a credit card. And as we went through, it was three to four weeks and we heard nothing similar to Preston's story. We did not hear anything. And so then I went ahead and I did a PayPal request saying, hey, uh, we haven't really gotten our product. We haven't gotten any shipping information. We have received no communication. PayPal said, awesome. We need to wait three days for the seller to respond. And at that point, we will refund your money. And it was interesting because the seller did respond. And they said, hey, yes, I'm so sorry. Here is your shipping ID tracking. Uh, you will get your item as soon as we can. We've just been a little bit busy. So I was like, okay, cool. Let's get some power tools. I'm excited. We got it. And there was a pair of fake earrings in this little itty bitty package. But it was enough that PayPal said, 
an item was purchased, an item was received, dispute's over. So then I got to go to my credit card company and say, hey, here's the circumstance. I tried to work with the website. I tried to work with PayPal. And my credit card company said, hey, absolutely, you will be refunded your money. This transaction has been stopped. You're all set to go. No harm, no foul. We got our money back. We lost a little bit of time. We were bummed that we didn't get power tools. But it happens. Uh, another one that happened, once again, a little bit anecdotal, but uh, my grandfather, he uh, lives far away. He's down in California. And it was hard because, you know, I try to help as best we can. Um, and he said he got a call from Microsoft that, that hey, you know, we noticed that your uh, Microsoft Surface device is not fully up to date. It's not secure. We would love to make sure that your device is fully secure and up to date. He's like, awesome. I would love support. He's in his 80s. He had somebody come in, a remote session into his Microsoft Surface, and legitimately install some antivirus software. And then they said, hey, you know, this is the free version of the software. If you would like to go ahead and move forward with the premium version of the software to make sure that your device is safe, we would love for you to run down to your local uh, drugstore and get a $50 um, Google Play Store credit so that we can actually pay for this and get your uh, transaction going. We're Microsoft, we don't really want to accept money, um, but we want to make sure that your device is secure. So my grandfather being diligent, he uh, went ahead and did that. Um, and then they tried to continue to install other security software. Oh, hey, do you want movies? Do you want music? Keep feeding us these uh, gift cards. And that was a bummer because he felt like he was being taken care of. And to a certain extent, the scam was just real enough. It was just real enough for him to say, oh, okay, this is valid. This is real. Except for the thing that Microsoft will never call to help you. It's similar. Microsoft, Amazon, odds are, uh, unless you are making a direct purchase or transaction and something goes wrong, you will not hear from them or unless you're a high level, you're a partner, or you're advertising with them, or you are on a service where it is in the contract that they're going to contact you, they never will. And, and we can say that as Microsoft partners, uh, we will go through the training, the facilitation. Uh, we deploy Microsoft products to, to a lot of different companies. They actually rely on Microsoft partners to be their hands and feet extended across communities and across businesses. Microsoft never really wants to handle any support requests. They provide that opportunity to their partner network. So is it too good to be true? Absolutely. Microsoft, Amazon, Google. If you did a transaction on Amazon, Amazon's absolutely going to keep that money. They will not call you to say, hey, we want you to verify that you bought that $700 Apple Watch. Uh, which is another common scam. If you're unfamiliar with those, we do have another video on the Whitman County Library System YouTube channel talking about how to protect yourself from those types of scams. When it comes to e-commerce, if it's too good to be true, odds are it is. And to keep that in mind. That being said, are there any questions? Uh, we'll be here for a few minutes. Uh, we know that there are a few uh, people in the room. So if you do want to uh, unmute yourself and come online, or if you want to type questions into the chat, we would love to, to help answer anything that we can. Yeah, this is Cody. Uh, I have a, a quick, actually a two-part question, I guess. Um, so talking about reviews, do you have kind of a ballpark figure of reviews, like an aggregate that you look for? So like, obviously, if something has 15,000 reviews, seemingly pretty reliable versus like if it has 100, uh, you know, what, what's the threshold you kind of look for for like, this is this item has enough reviews that the reviews are going to be helpful? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. That's a really good question. I, I tend to see it as something that's fairly relative. Um, E.g., if there's clothing items, clothing items will usually have at minimum 2,000 if it's been a good product. Um, there's kind of this weird styming that happens up around the 200 to 500 reviews. Um, if it's below 100, take a look at them because most of them are actually probably purchased on that initial run. Um, where if it is a tech gadget, if, if it's a rare item, 
if it is, it's probably going to be about 100 reviews. Once again, I, I look at that qualitative. So I, it's hard to say that there's a kind of a threshold. Um, but if there was going to be one, I'd say at least 300 to 500 reviews. Um, that first 100 is going to be almost always purchased, especially through a dropshipping vendor. Preston, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, I would agree with relative to, uh, especially for like business on the end of looking at the amount of time that has passed and kind of judging based on that where, oh, there's three reviews. It's been a week. Maybe give it some time because we, we don't know. Uh, or if it's been a six month period, there were a bunch of one and two star reviews during the first month, but then we've gotten more reviews. That is an opportunity for, oh, okay, there, it was a rough start we've gotten better, things have improved. Uh, and a lot of times too, when you're sampling and reading, being able to tell uh, a lot of paid reviews will say the same thing and be very samey in like generic, generic phrases, you're not talking about anything, as opposed to we're looking for things where like, if somebody's taking the time of like, here are my pros and cons lists of the product and here's my experience, I unbox it or whatever it is, is a, that inherent review itself tends to be more valuable valuable than the number. But like, yeah, it's if it's pretty established, great. If it's like under 20, if you're in that 20 to 50 range, you're gambling yeah. uh, in a lot of ways. And it's like, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Good luck. Well, and, and another thing to keep in mind too, and actually you, you kind of jogged my memory on that a little bit is, there is this idea, especially with electronics, but I mean, with anything, you are actually going to run into bad batches um, where you are going to see really bad reviews for a one to three month time slot. And so then it actually may be worthwhile to switch website vendors. So maybe you are looking at something on Amazon, you're noticing that they might have or might be shipping a bad batch of items. Whereas if they went, if you went to eBay or another um, e-commerce e-tailer, to find the same item, even though it might be $5 more, but they're not having that run of bad reviews for the bad batch, then you're able to in help ensure that you're getting a quality product um, and working through that way. And even then, if it is a bad batch, um, purchasing from someone that has a good return policy, aka Costco, because they're the best at that, um, that's a way to, another way to hedge yourself on that. Uh, what, what was the what was the second part of the question? Yeah, so it's kind of about the the paid reviews. Um, do you have a sense of if a vendor does pay for reviews, like how many reviews do they typically pay for? Um, and I guess another way of, of framing the question is, you know, if something has fifteen thousand reviews, nine percent of which are five star, is that like is that more reasonable? Like these are probably a pretty good product versus you know. It was a hundred reviews. Yeah. Yeah. Part yeah. of it is period of time and looking at it. If there's a, all right, in a 30 day period on a product that has been launched for three years, there is a spike in reviews that all happened in the same time. That's kind of a keen giveaway of like, that was probably a paid for thing. It does often happen in batches. So mm -hmm. it's probably not going to be 10 or 20. If those are paid, that's you paid your friend. And yeah. uh, let's do it. That's usually like in the, I'd say 50 upwards. Uh, it's usually not to a thousand. It can be to a thousand, but I would say it does land at that 100 to 300 range. Yeah. And, and there is typically a strategy behind it. Um, a lot of people will do uh, launch the product on Amazon. They'll go and work with a Amazon marketing person to filter in those reviews and some people will do it legitimately and say, hey, we want to send 50 of these products out for free. Uh, you will, we will, you have to say in the review that you received this as a part of a promotion. Um, that's pretty common in general. Um, and then you can kind of mitigate from there. You'll see that in the qualitative part of it. Um, some people will just say, hey, we'll reimburse you after the fact. Please do the review. The review has to sit for two weeks. Um, and then after those reviews have occurred, then they're going to pay into Amazon's pay-per-click program where it helps push that product to the top of the list as an Amazon-sponsored item to say, hey, this is actually a bestseller. We have all five-star reviews. Check this out. 
as a way to build that social credibility before they put that bigger advertising spend push. So there are strategies that a lot of marketers will use in that, um, but typically they'll stop around that, I'd say 20 to 50, um, because it does get expensive after that point, depending on the price point uh, price point of the item. Um, but some do go up to at least 100. So that's where, on that relative scale, re- read the reviews, see see how they're, they're coming across. Um, some marketplace, marketplace we didn't talk about were app marketplaces, oh, and yeah. that's, there's a lot. I, I'd say it's probably the areas where that specific practice happens the most, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, where you start getting those higher volume, like it will be past 100 to 200 because of the volumes there. And, and I will say Amazon specifically does try to mitigate those reviews. Like I've had reviews removed because they've suspected that type of activity. Um, whereas no, I actually, I just really like taking pictures of the products and trying to add a quality review. Um, if I'm buying a uh, oh, computer part or something, I want to show like, oh, hey, it's working. I've gotten those flagged for whatever reason, just because it was a third party vendor that they allowed in. So thank you all for joining us today for today's uh, webinar on how to buy online safely. Uh, this is recorded and will be on the Whitman County Library System YouTube channel. Go check it out. Like, subscribe, hit the bell. Um, there's a lot of incredible resources available. Um, lots of good content. Thank you. And enjoy the day. Yeah.